All right, this week we are looking at, uh, we are starting to look at, finally, film language. Really look at cinematic language. We've done some dip our toes into the water moments prior in the semester, but this is the first week that we are really focusing on a particular aspect of film language and we are starting as many film textbooks do it's pretty common for film textbooks to start with mise-en-scene mise-en-scene what is mise-en-scene well it's a french term that means production design really um, and uh, our our case study for this week is moulin rouge uh, perhaps just so i can keep butchering my french pronunciation being a bad Canadian. Um, but uh, Anne Hornaday in Talking Pictures, How to Watch Movies, which I've recommended before here on the podcast and in the course, um, as a great, great book, great introductory book uh, with no pictures, though. That's why uh, I think that if you're, you know, your first look, if you look, do your first academic look at film, uh, I can't recommend looking at movies and introduction to film enough. Um, there are other great film books, but I, I just really like this one by Richard Barsom and Dave Monahan. But Anne Hornaday does a great job of defining production design. She says, put most simply, the production designer is responsible for everything we see on the screen. And that's really what mise-en-scene has come to mean, whatever it's... Uh, you know, its its actual denotation is, uh, its connotation is everything we see on the screen, which makes it a murky term, but it's also why it's one of the first terms that we look at when we're looking at film language. Every environment the characters inhabit and pass through, every item they, they use or look at, every piece of decor, no matter how tiny. Even the most naturalistic, undressed locations have been changed in some way by the production designer to fit the needs of of the story being filmed. And I think immediately of the deserts in Tunisia where the first Star Wars movie was filmed and they would go out and they'd groom the desert. Why? Because, you know, everyone would walk around in it and they needed to look like no one had walked on it before C-3PO and R2-D2 make their way through it. So that is a natural on-location moment and there's still production design going on in that moment. And that in direct opposition to what we get in Moulin Rouge, which is an incredibly artificial, it wears its artificiality on its sleeve, uh, very, very artificial production design. And uh, in previous iterations of this course, uh, I used uh, Sleepy Hollow. And one of my students said, you know, it'd be great for mise-en-scene. Moulin Rouge. And I was like, you're absolutely right. Because of how it is so uh, clearly artificial that it is, it's going out, of, it's, it's never going, well, we want you to think we're really showing you what the Moulin Rouge was like in a uh, realistic way, in a, in a way that's very similar within its own diegesis, for sure, but uh, there's something else going on here with the production design for Moulin Rouge. And Anne Hornaday says that Oscars for production design typically reward the most obvious and ostentatious examples of the craft. And Moulin Rouge was awarded uh, two awards. They, they won for art direction and best costuming uh, at the Oscars. And um, they, were, they were nominated for eight awards. It was nominated for eight awards, but only one for those two. And right there we see, okay, well, this is one of those obvious and ostentatious examples of production design. And it was... Uh, it was awarded the Oscar. Extravagant historical costume dramas, says Anne Hornaday, or visually inventive extravaganzas. And I think we can certainly say that Moulin Rouge is a little bit of both. This tendency is understandable because design is most readily apparent, most readily apparent in period and fantasy movies. And next week we take a look at Fellowship of the Ring. And I think what's going to be fascinating as a contrast is that here we have a real place. You can, you can still go to the Moulin Rouge if you go to Paris today. Um, I don't know if it's open because of COVID, but you could go. And uh, you could stand outside the building. It was it, the Moulin Rouge that that is being referenced in this film was a real place, and characters like Toulouse Lautrec were real people. But this movie isn't trying to be really historical. It's it's trying even less than Black Klansman was, 
And what's interesting to me is that when we get to Fellowship of the Ring, we're going to see production design working overtime to make it look like it's really happened. That the production design for Fellowship of the Ring, uh, the, the, the head of Weta Workshops, Richard Taylor, said that one of the things they, the, 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 the design approach was that they treated Tolkien's fiction as though it were a real history of Middle Earth. And that comes out in the production design of that movie. But in this movie, it's, it's not trying very hard to be period accurate. So what is mise-en-scene? French for what is put into the scene. And I've got the pronunciation there, mise-en-scene, right? You should just say it with me, mise-en-scene. Come on, say it with me. Because, you know, when we get a tough name or a difficult word and we don't pronounce it, then we'll never say it. We're always going to go mise en scène into our hand. And uh, I, I just say, get in there and, and give it a try. Mise en scène. Um, and uh, we have all sorts of difficult names today, like Baz Luhrmann. I don't know if that's a really difficult name or not, but it is, uh, it's a unique name. I don't know a lot of Baz's, uh, nor do I know any Luhrmann's. So, uh, you know, like my name, Pershawn, lots of people mispronounce it. Mise en scène, we want to be able to say it. So go ahead and pronounce it a few times. Um, it's the overall look and feel of a movie, the sum of what we see and experience. And that is what makes this such a contentious term. Because if it's the sum of what we see and experience, and then doesn't that mean it's the cinematography? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about lighting and composition today. Uh, so absolutely. Um, is that just everything then? I, I, that's why I like to, to bring it back to production design because I think that grounds it a little bit better. But the textbook states that uh, mise-en-scene has two major components, design and composition. And the composition side of things is certainly about cinematography, but it's really about how things are in the frame, right? How things are in the frame. And uh, what's amazing to me about Moulin Rouge is how crowded the film often is. Uh, the scene in the loft where, you know, they're trying to do the sound of music. They're, they're, they're working on their spectacular, spectacular play at the beginning of the film. And we have every character in that scene in the scene. In, in you know several of the shots. We can see Toulouse-Lautrec performing. We can see Sati over by the piano. We can see Christian up on the faux set of the mountains. We can see the narcoleptic Argentinian's legs. And we can see the playwright who you know runs out in a huff shortly. But they're all in there. And great composition does that. It gives us everything we need to see but it doesn't make it a mess. Although there are points at which I suppose people would think, well, no, Moulin Rouge does get messy at various points. I think there's a deliberate messiness to certain shots in this film. But even in the moment when the, uh, the group that wants to put on Spectacular Spectacular is in um, Satine's boudoir, and they're trying to pitch the play the, this great bohemian musical set in Switzerland <clears throat> to the Duke, to this nefarious Duke. And what blows me away about those shots is how they're able to get everyone in them. And it has this frantic, uh, frenetic feel to it. It's very intense as a result of its, its edits, but if you know, you go in and you do screen captures from those shots and everybody is in their place. And I'll remind you again that, uh, you know, uh, Michael Caine has said that one of the hardest things about being a film actor isn't acting. It's, it's hitting your mark. And it's especially difficult if you're in a scene with a ton of people. And we talked about that a little bit before with Little Women, right? Getting all of the cast into the shot. <clears throat> and the textbook suggests that when we watch films and we want to think about these two components of design and composition. We're going to begin with design. It asks a series of questions, questions to ask yourself while watching films. What are the elements of design in the scene? You know, what, what, is, what is just there? You know, if they're on location, they didn't plant all the trees necessarily, although 
don't count that out because every now and again that happens. Um, how do the design choices make you feel? Right? And I've got this shot of Christian and Satine uh, with this heart frame door in the background and you know fireworks exploding. We know what we're supposed to feel in that moment, right? Um, there's a great moment in a, it's not a great miniseries, but there was a, there was a uh, sort of biopic done about Ian Fleming that referenced James Bond in a lot of ways. And when he and his soon-to-be wife kiss for the first time, a, a bomb goes off and, and glass sprays in all around them. And it's like, that probably never happened. They didn't kiss just when the bomb went off. Maybe they had their first kiss the night of a bombing, but, you know, did they time it just right? No, but the film does. Why? Because what does the first kiss with your true love feel like? It feels like fireworks. It feels like explosions, it, you know, and, and film will visually communicate this to us in lots of different ways. Moulin Rouge is distinct from other Hollywood films in its design because of how it borrows or appropriates uh, elements from Bollywood cinema. And I'm referencing here an article by Sangeeta uh, Gopal and Sujata Murti called Bollywood in Drag, Moulin Rouge and the Aesthetics of Global Cinema. And they talk about how Baz Luhrmann was attracted to, and I love this phrase, attracted to Bollywood's generic promiscuity, generic promiscuity, which appears to contrast sharply with the, the narrational logic of Hollywood cinema. So if we have fireworks literally go off in a Hollywood film, people go, oh, it's so obvious, right? It's just still on the nose, that kind of thing. And um, this film doesn't care. It's just like we are, we are going to be unabashedly shooting off fireworks or you know, telegraphing certain concepts in ways that may feel really, really obvious, but this, this film doesn't care. It's, it's just like, we are just going to give you this great big emotional surge throughout. And that uh, is also something that is, is borrowed from Bollywood cinema. There's a ton of borrowings in this film from Bollywood cinema, and I'll, I'll, I'll reference a few of them. Um, but, you know, how do the design choices make you feel? And, for my students, or just for people who want to do, I think, a, a more objective job of reading film, how do you think the design choices were meant to make you feel? Because when I teach horror films or scary stories occasionally, there's always some guy in the room. It's always a guy. It's almost never a girl. Um, there's always a guy who would be like, ah, it wasn't scary, right? To, to show that they, you know, I'm tough. Uh, it wasn't scary. Oh, it, it didn't scare me. Yeah, but what was it supposed to do? And can you imagine that it might be scary to someone? Not you, you jaded, heartless beast. Uh, you're probably a bit like me. Uh, although I, I try to give myself over to whatever the emotional um, affect what they want to go for. I'm like, okay, do it, do it. I will, I'm, I'm like putty in your hands, manipulate me. And, uh, and when I watch Moulin Rouge, I get into the whole sense of this tragic, comic, musical extravaganza, you know? It's just, it's crazy. And so I'm like, okay, let's do crazy. And if I'm going to watch a more restrained love story, then I'll dial it back, right? I'm not going to be like, they don't have any fireworks going off and there's no windows exploding. So we need to not only think about how we feel, because that's, that's highly subjective, but what do we think the filmmaker wanted to make us feel? Maybe we just don't feel that way because we're having a bad day. What do all these design choices make you think about? What associations do you make? Uh, you know, what does that remind you of? Pay attention to those things because film is deeply affective. It affects us at the emotional level. And I think we should pay attention to how we are manipulated emotionally by film because that's why we watch movies. It's why we, we love stories. We love stories because they manipulate our emotional landscape. And we can legitimately self-medicate through film 
you know, I'm having a bad day. What am I going to do? I'm going to watch something that's going to make me feel better or make me feel the way that I want to because, you know, strangely, one of the things that I love to watch when I'm in really low depths of being totally bummed out is I'm going to go and I'm going to watch a horror movie. And I know that may seem strange, but that's one of the things that I do. And so I think we should pay attention to the way that design choices, all the choices in film, make us feel. And I love, that's one of the reasons I love this textbook is that it's going, hey, how does this make you feel? Not let's take a step back and go straight to some deeply analytical thing, but let's start our analysis with the, the space of emotional affect. How and why do the filmmakers do this? Well, filmmakers do this in all sorts of ways. And why do they do it? Well, once we know the how, we can start to construct the why. So the costume design, I mean, it's no surprise that this film won for best costuming. When we look at uh, every one of the diamond dogs, uh, courtesans, the women, the dancers of the Moulin Rouge were given distinct uh, costumes to make them stand apart from each other. Now, there's obviously extras way in the background, but there are a bunch of, we, we might say, sort of second string actors playing these dancers and although we don't get their characters fleshed out they're not they're not round they're not well developed um we we know who they are there's a sort of immediate visual recognition which is very impressive when you consider how fast the sequences that they appear in are moving because the camera moves a lot in this film and we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about that and the edits are incredibly quick there's this there's a point in the can can sequence where there are more cuts than there are seconds of time elapsed there are more cuts in that sequence than there are seconds elapsed this is very very rapid and yet i i can pick out who these various dancers are i don't know their names necessarily i might not even know their characters although some of them certainly do emerge over the course of the film but I know who they are because of the distinctive nature of the visual design of their costumes. Satine has a wealth of different costumes, and, and it's wonderful to take a look at design art next to the realization, uh, be it for costume and makeup and hairstyle, or for the design of various environments, the sets. And... Uh, in, the, in some of the documentary content about Moulin Rouge, uh, one of the costumers said that they really went on a journey with Nicole Kidman to find the right looks to evoke everything that, that Baz Luhrmann wanted from the character of Satine, which was supposed to reference a bunch of classic uh, female uh, stars. Uh, Marilyn Monroe is one that comes up over and over again in these these documentaries, um, but classic beauties of of the screen, and they went through a process of hey let's put all these different costumes on Nicole Kidman and try to figure out what mood they strike and whether or not they really work for the film, and what's interesting to note about seeing all of those is that not all of them made it to the screen. So we often think of uh, only deleted scenes as elements that don't make it on screen. But sometimes there are costume designs as well. Um, famously, and maybe we'll talk about this again when we get to Star Wars, but uh, the original design for Han Solo's costume was a lot more Flash Gordon, 1930s sort of style Flash Gordon. And Harrison Ford said, no way, and, the, and then worked with the costuming department to get this sort of space cowboy look that has become iconic for Han Solo. And that's the other thing that I think is important to think about when we're thinking about mise-en-scene, when we're thinking about costume and makeup and hairstyle, is that we'll sometimes think of certain costumes, certain design elements as iconic, as how could it have been any other way? And yet what we find is that just like Indiana Jones going under the truck in Raiders of the Lost Ark, that wasn't the original plan. That wasn't the original plan. And so with Satine's wealth of costumes, there were some visual ideas that got left behind. Um, and, and some of it's fairly obvious, right? She sings Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend, and she's got this dress that is reminiscent of Marilyn Monroe while she's waiting for the bus stop in one of her films. 
it's got this glitter to it and and there's just all these great pop culture references happening through not only the 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 song but the the costume in tandem with that and it's a reminder that none of these things work in isolation they are always working in tandem and and the best films get those things to work together in a way that really flows that really synthesizes Nicole Kidman's costumes for Satine change over the course of the film. She's she's changing costumes as much as, you know, certain pop stars do on stage, you know, like from one song to the next, running off stage to go and change into something else. And uh, and they, they, they have a range of ideas to them, right? Like the black outfit that she wears to seduce uh, Christian, when she thinks he's the Duke, is distinct from the red dress that she wears when she meets him on top of the elephant later on. Now, they are both coded in a in a sense with the idea of passion, of sexuality, but the red dress is, while not demure, more demure than what she was wearing when she was on the trapeze, what she was wearing when she tried to seduce Christian. And then we have to contrast that with some of the things that she wears when they have, uh, that Christian and and her have have developed this romance, that we get these really low-key costumes. You know, this is just a bathrobe, no, no, no frills, no glitter, no glamour at this point. And her costumes are, are usually very played down in terms of their intensity and for color or or um the material that it's made from when nicole kidman and and ewan mcgregor have to as their characters play out a serious scene ewan mcgregor's design for the film and we might say design there's not really much that they did to christian i mean like the other characters they did some stuff but it looks to me like they just threw ewan mcgregor into a regular pretty regular looking shirt and they really didn't do much to his hair and that's right you're absolutely right the costume designers for the film said that they didn't want to put him into a waistcoat and they didn't want to do anything particularly ostentatious to him. They wanted to keep him, I guess, sort of pure as it were, um, to convey the innocence of the character. But what I want to think about for just a moment is how actors change from film to film, not only via their performance, but via what uh, costuming can do for them. When we think about Ewan McGregor in Train Spotting, that's a world of difference from what he looks like in this film. I mean, we we probably recognize those those eyes, but gosh, what a difference in hairstyle! And that translates to some degree to performance. But char- actors say, like, once you put the costume on, you really feel like you're the person. Uh, here he is in Black Hawk Down playing uh, an, a soldier, and we recognize that he's a soldier. I honestly didn't recognize him as Ewan McGregor uh, when I first saw the movie. He's, he wasn't a big name at the time, but even still, I mean, he was big enough that I you know, could usually pick you know, those actors out. And then I saw that he was in the film, and I was like, I don't remember him being in the film, and he sort of like just fades into the background, playing Obi-Wan Kenobi. And these were all around the same time as Moulin Rouge. His hair is longer, he's got the beard, he's supposed to look, you know, like a Jedi, uh, has a very particular feel to it, uh, sort of 80s mullet kind of feel to it. Uh, And in Jack the Giant Killer, this is much later, but I've always appreciated the costume design for the character that McGregor played in Jack the Giant Killer because he's got this sort of flamboyant swashbuckler thing going on. And his haircut and his mustache and his little you know, sort of goatee beard, telegraph that. His performance does it too. It, there's a really great marriage of performance and costume in this film. And this is not a great movie, but there's some great costume moves. There's some great mise-en-scene in this film. And mise-en-scene is one of my favorite things to talk about when it comes to movies because sometimes the story sucked and the mise-en-scene, the production design, was fabulous. And that's something that I think we should still be paying attention to. Jim Broadbent playing Ziedler is not the Jim Broadbent that we see in the Harry Potter films. 
or the Narnia movies, right? In Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, playing the, the, the quirky old uncle. Um, and different character. The way that Ziedler is, you know, is it, 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 Jim Broadbent, you can always recognize him because of that voice. It's very rare that he does much with his voice to really change things up, but there is a difference in these characters. They're all a little quirky. But I don't think that we would confuse the uncle of Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe with the scheming Ziedler. Like, he cares, right? He cares about Satine, but he's a bit of a schemer. And the movie communicates that in uh, the costuming. The Duke's costuming in the scene where he comes in and he's like, you know, let's go boating, um, makes him ridiculous. So costuming does all sorts of things. It makes someone glamorous, it can make them beautiful, it can make them normal, it can make them uh, eccentric, it can make them look like a, you know, an idiot, a goofball, a buffoon. I love this this little moment here with, with Sati. Um, I don't know, because I'm wearing my Doctor Who scarf right now. I'm wearing my multicolored Doctor Who scarf, which is uh, was, was Tom Baker's. Uh, scarf on uh, on the Doctor Who series. I want to talk about costuming. I but I can't help but think that Satie's scarf is supposed to be a reference to it. I don't know, or maybe maybe those were just popular scarfs at the time. I don't know. But uh, as I was going through doing screen captures for these uh, for these lectures, and I saw Satie, the piano player's scarf, I was like, is that a Doctor Who scarf? And now that I'm sitting here looking at myself on a screen and looking at Satie, I'm thinking that maybe I'm just you know dreaming but at the same time i mean my god look at look at the 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 piano itself and uh you know what what mise-en-scene do we have going on here this has got a strong steampunk vibe coming off of it the, the fact that it looks like he's got absinthe powering this musical instrument that's what it looks like to me it's like like, like this is an absinthe powered musical instrument feels very vintage TARDIS. And this is before the, the reboot of Doctor Who. So, you know, I don't know for sure. I can't say for sure that that's what's going on here. Maybe it was the other way around. Maybe Doctor Who borrows from this. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm rambling a bit. I'm kind of off on a rabbit trail there. But uh, I love I love Satie's whole setup. I think there's just something really, really great about that. And this bridges us. This moves us from design uh, with costume, makeup, and hairstyle to design with setting, decor, and props, properties, right? Uh, the word properties will refer to the props that we see in the film. And I think it's really cool how at the beginning of the movie, when uh, the camera moves to the streets of Montmartre, and we see it initially through the despair of Christian. Through the eyes of despair, we see the absinthe bar and this absinthe addict, and he's a wreck. And then we get to go back in time when Christian first showed up in Paris and see it through the rose-colored glasses of Christian pre-despair. And the difference right there, right, that we can see with how color matters, the way that the actor's uh, outfit is either, you know, sort of, distressed or neat um the the way that people hold themselves within those costumes right this is all part of mise-en-scene the moulin rouge itself this glittering um diamond this beautiful place there's just an opulence about the way that they have it lit up feels like christmas feels like a holiday parade and uh Baz Luhrmann said to the people who were doing the production design for the film that he wanted a world where breaking into song would make sense. And he said, I don't want artificial reality. I want real artificiality. Now, I don't really know that that makes a huge difference when you do those kind of word plays, but the idea that, that Luhrmann wanted to create a world where breaking into song would make sense informs why the Moulin Rouge looks so fake. Because we, we look at this and we say, I know that's not a real place. I know that that's a set. In fact, it's a miniature set. It's a very tiny set. Um, there's, a, there's a really great photo of Ewan McGregor sitting next to it. 
uh, if you if you Google production design for uh, for Moulin Rouge. But here I, you know, I have an image where we can see just how tiny some of these sets are, and that they were using forced perspective to give the impression of greater size. But the movie is never at great pains to make you think eh, this is all real. From the very moment the film starts, it announces its artificiality of setting decor, properties, etc. With the opening of a red curtain. That it's as though Lerman's saying everything that follows is a fiction. Everything that's fo that follows is staged. None of this is real. When this movie begins with curtains opening and the 20th Century Fox... Uh, fanfare being shown on that stage, uh, I think that it's it's a signal that there's a there's a level of artificiality here, and that this film is unabashed about it. Something that uh, Zack Snyder would uh, would uh, mimic in uh, the film Sucker Punch. He opens the movie with the same sort of the the curtains opening upon a stage to highlight uh, the artificiality there as well. Here. We have uh, Toulouse-Lautrec, Sati, and their companions climbing up the side of the elephant. And this is one of those places where, it, you know, it feels like a Wes Anderson movie in some ways. Wes Anderson is famous for not worrying too much about making the fantastical elements or the extreme elements of his movies photorealistic. And we should know that photorealistic special effects are primarily a Western convention. Now they've that's been ported to other to other film industries. China is certainly trying harder and harder to keep up with the Joneses insofar as uh, special effects go. Bollywood isn't. And again, uh, with with Lerman borrowing from um, Bollywood in what. Uh, uh, in what Gopal and Murti call a mix of admiration, misunderstanding, and bricolage. I love that. Admiration, misunderstanding, and bricolage. It's just a mix of all these things. Um, but it's, it, you know, he's, he's referencing that lack of photoreality in the special effects in this moment where you know, Christian's uh, cohorts, his, his, his friends, his, his fellow conspirators to create spectacular, spectacular climbing up the side of the elephant. And this lack of, of photo reality can be seen in Japanese giant monster movies, uh, even recent ones made after, say, Jurassic Park, where you know we we know we can make a dinosaur look real. Made after the eh, semi-realistic looking Godzilla from the 1997-98 one with Matthew Broderick that was made in America, um, but Japan would continue to put a guy in a suit and smash miniature buildings. Why? Because it was an art form. Because that's what audiences have come to expect of the mise-en-scene of a giant monster movie. That, that when Godzilla steps on a city, you wouldn't be surprised to see Thomas the Tank Engine come around the corner because the sets look similar. And again, it's, it's, it's North America that goes, we got to have photorealistic special effects. And that's only been since really since Star Wars because prior to Star Wars you had the movies of stop motion animation with guys like Ray Harryhausen and you could tell that what was happening on the screen wasn't real but you didn't care because it was cool it looked cool and you admired the art of stop motion animation as many of you might who will watch Nightmare Before Christmas in the next few weeks or in the next few months depending on when you know you feel that it's appropriate to watch that film But this movie has this artificiality running all the way through. And there are moments when the dream sequences are clearly dream sequences. But there are also moments when it's supposed to be real. And when, you know, Christian and Satine and the Duke go on this picnic, we can tell this is not on location. We can tell that's not really Paris in the background. But it does what the film needs it to do to tell the story and is consistent with that real artificiality that 
we don't lose that sense of mise-en-scene. And the actors said, you know, everything in this movie was shot on a soundstage. Every, everyone. And so <clears throat> that artificiality runs from start to finish. And we never lose that feel at any point. We, we know that everything that we're seeing is a set. And we don't mind because that's the aesthetic that this film is going for with these rich sets that convey all sorts of things, right? Like Satine's boudoir, all the red conveys this sense of passion and desire, the way that that's all dressed up. Here, I, I'm bringing back Satie at this point, but I've already said what I wanted to about the, uh, the absinthe-driven piano, but it is a great piece of decor. That is a great prop. What a wonderful, wonderful prop. And it's just sitting there in the background. I think it's one of the one of the great things about production design is is when the filmmaker doesn't go out of their way to focus on it too much. Because if you if the camera's focused on the set, it's probably not telling the story anymore. And this is just in the background. And we're gonna see this again next week with Fellowship of the Ring. Incredible production design, so much detail in the back. And the film isn't too worried about making sure that we we get all that, right? Now, I couldn't find a really good reference for this concept of how pre-production images will anticipate the way that a film is going to be lit, the way in which they will light the movie. Um, and... So what I did is I, I grabbed something from The Shape of Water, which we did a few weeks back. And for those of you who are listening to this on the podcast, you can check this out by going to the YouTube channel for Doc Pershawn. Really ought to streamline these things and just call the YouTube channel Triple Bladed Sword as well. Um, or you can go to the Instagram for Triple Bladed Sword and those images will be there. So you have pre-production where the designer says, this is what we think it should look like. And then you have the reality in production of what could actually be done. Or in some cases, the only time that, you know, you'd be able to set that information, like, you, you know, this set at night is different than it's going to be uh, during the day. I've also got an example from Sleepy Hollow. As I said, I've done that before with mise-en-scene. It's a great movie to study for mise-en-scene because it's a fascinating study of, again, I think it's still got that sense of real artificiality, but they shoot on location in that movie. And I don't feel like they break that sense of real artificiality. It still feels very much like a, like a cinematic experience as opposed to this really ever happened. But here's the, the tree... Uh, the, the twisted tree from that and here's how it was realized in the actual film and that is on a set done uh, in, in terms of what they had to do with lighting is they just filled the upper part of the set with uh, the fog this, this fake smoke and then they hit it with the lights and what that does is it just washes out the smoke which obscured that there was no sky that beyond the smoke, there were a bunch of really powerful lights glaring down on what is not a location, but is rather a soundstage. And my favorite example in the history of cinema of production design between you know what they did in the pre-production process and then the realization is The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, this German silent film, which is often called Expressionist. Um, I don't know that that is completely true, but that's a, that's a conversation for another day. Um, but the production designer on the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, Walter Weiman, um, repeatedly pointed out the distinct differences between actual architecture and film sets I'm saying like, that's what a real building looks like, but a film set should do something else. A film set should, and here's the expressionist side of this, express something about the emotional landscape of the film and insisted that the term film architecture should be replaced by film painting because he really felt that film was like painting, except that it was paintings that moved. Now, check out Ryman's um, production art, and it looks very nearly identical to what was realized on the set of Caligari. Like, really, really close to identical. Um... And you see that with Tim Burton's work as well, because he's heavily, heavily influenced by Caligari. 
So sometimes you, you get this sort of thing and sometimes you just they have vague ideas and then they try to work those things out. Lighting is part of mise-en-scene. The way in which a scene is lit is obviously part of what's inside the frame. And the sequence where the uh, narcoleptic Argentinian performs Roxanne and does this tango juxtaposed with the Duke and Satine having a dinner and then him sexually assaulting her in the Gothic Tower are lit in very distinct ways. Same sort of thing that we've seen, you know, Little Women, Shape of Water, we keep seeing these distinct color schemes. And Christian's angst is red. Satine, the Duke, at dinner, dark, blue, cool, the dance, the, the tango, Roxanne, passion. And so we get, we get hints of red until Christian walks out of the building and then it's really, really clear that, that you know, his color coding is red. We already know that Satine's in this sequence of the film is blue and that's a reversal. That's an interesting reversal because usually Satine's red. She's coded as red. And we get this shot where uh, Ewan McGregor's head comes into the frame and he's lit in red and we can see the Gothic Tower and we can see Satine on the balcony and she's blue and and that helps us to be able to understand the cross-cutting between Satine up on the balcony and Christian down on the ground without having to think about it too hard but it also conveys their states of mind so the lighting is doing more than just making sure that we can see what's on the screen it's also telling us what the emotional uh, sense is in these moments um, I love the moment when um, Satine and Ziedler are behind this 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 covering this barrier that the, you know the diamond dogs hold up while Satine changes costumes and Ziedler informs her what the deal is with snagging the duke this is supposed to be the same type of lighting but you'll note if you take a look at these images that while they're both lit from below, Ziedler has that sort of Halloween lighting that the textbook talks about, that lit from below that makes him look a little macabre. Like, not straight up scary. He's not supposed to be straight up scary. But if you, if you contrast that with how Satine is lit, she's clearly getting front lighting to smooth it out so that she doesn't look Halloweenish. Why is Ziedler, you know, looking so nefarious here? Well, it's, it's the lighting telling us that he's a bit of a schemer and that Satine is caught up in those schemes to some degree, but it immediately makes us look at Ziedler and go, oh, he's, you know, he's kind of freaking me out. Um, and, and the lighting is, is, is what achieves that. We get wonderful backlighting when Christian and Satine come together and you might say, well, that's actually front lighting. That's the lighting that's, you know, lighting the stage of the Moulin Rouge. Sure. But the camera angle makes it backlighting, right? To make, to give it this halo, to give it this glow, to give it this nimbus that makes this moment um, more beautiful and gives it a sense of greater, I guess, um, you know, it highlights uh, that it's this moment that transcends the mundane when they, you know, confessing their, their true love to each other. And we even get moments of low-key lighting in this film um, when, uh, when Satine is first revealed uh, right before she does Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend and um, that she's just coming in. It's like we're, we're, we're getting her revealed to us using low-key lighting. Now, production values, you know, uh, the, the textbook talks about this the amount and quality of human and physical resources devoted to the image determines a film's overall style. But you'd be amazed at how that can be determined by, you know, how much money a film has to work with. But what I love about what the textbook says here is that it says it's partly determined by a film's lighting style that certain genres have distinct lighting styles, like we expect horror films to be lit very differently than we do romantic comedies. Um, and good lighting and good cinematography can make a cheap film incredible. 
And if you ever want to see a movie that was made for very, very cheap, that has some incredible moments of lighting, and it's mostly natural lighting, but it is gorgeous, and it takes a good cameraman to capture that, then you should see Gareth Edwards' Monsters. There's some beautiful, beautiful lighting uh, and camera work done in that, in that film. Great, great work with light in that movie. Moving on with composition to this idea of the rule of thirds. Um, and these, these are parts of the questions that we ask ourselves when we're thinking about composition. So we already talked about the questions that we ask ourselves when we are looking at design. Now we're looking at composition. How are shots framed? Where are figures and props placed in the frame? And the textbook talks about open and closed framing. We don't have a ton of examples in this particular film. There are a few moments where there's open and closed framing going on, but I don't really, I don't want to get into that uh, aspect of it today. I want to, I want to focus on this rule of thirds, just to show um, how uh, the rule of thirds is meant to balance visual elements, because there's so many visual elements in Moulin Rouge. Uh, in the can-can sequence, it's just, a, it's just a mess. And there, the rule of thirds probably goes right out the window. But I grabbed these photos somewhat randomly. I didn't think too hard about which photos I was grabbing, and then I just dumped them into this grid to see how they would play out. And because the textbook says not all film, not all photographs use the rule of thirds. I've read articles where they're like, rule of thirds is bullshit. Um, yeah, but it's a good place to start. I think, you know, knowing that you need to think about how to compose a shot is important. So while no, you don't always have to use the rule of thirds, it can be very helpful for balancing the visual elements within the frame. And so we get these vertical and these horizontal sections where content can be in the frame. So here we have one of the diamond dogs dead center. Here we've got sateen again dead center. And like I say, I just grabbed these. These were not, oh, I'm going to do this one. I would just be like, you know, looking at these tiny little thumbnails and thinking that looks really cool, right? Like this is an overhead shot of sateen riding across, you know, crowd surfing the rich men who come to the Moulin Rouge. And compositionally, it's gorgeous. We see her clearly because her costume is in contrast. She's shimmering white silver light on a field of mostly black, mostly black. And she's dead center in the frame. Here we have Ziedler and the Duke, and they are occupying the uh, you know these two third positions, um, Ziedler over on the left-hand side and the Duke on the right. Now, there's other ways to frame that shot, but that is a nice, simple way of putting that information into the screen that doesn't require our eye to be running all over the place. Here again, um, Satine and Christian in those positions of the first, you know, the first uh, pole, I guess we'd say, first uh, axis, and then the second one, the second vertical one, um, lining those things up. And here's one of those crazy shots where we've got five people performing madly for the Duke. And there's still a sort of sense of composition here that Nicole Kidman is dead center. Um, Ewan McGregor is right on the one axis. And then, you know, we've got the other characters further out, but they're pretty close to standing exactly where they need to be instead of just willy nilly being in the frame. The composition really, really matters. Now, there's another aspect to composition. It's not just where everyone is in the frame. It's how are they moving within the frame? Because movement is a huge part of film. And we're going to talk about movement again when we talk about cinematography. Cinematography, But here, you know, the question, how does the film use movement? Are frames open or closed? How do the figures move? And you know, an open frame, you can move in and out of it, and there's stuff happening outside of it. Closed frame, we're not worried about things that are outside. Um, we get a lot of open frame moments, and here I've got a shot of um, the cinematographer for the film moving on a crane. And you watch anything about how this film was shot, and you will see cameras in motion. Not standing still, so it's not just how the actors within the frame are moving, but it's also how is the camera moving? Here's a shot of a steady cam operator running across the dance floor during the can-can sequence and capturing the frenetic madness 
of the dance floor. Something that I think that this film desperately wants to do, right? So these last questions, how do the composition choices make you feel? What do they make you think about? How and why do the filmmakers do this? And I've got this shot of Ewan McGregor. He blurts out in song at this point. Up until this point, he's been kind of hesitant about getting into, uh, you know, what all the all the partying that's going on at the Moulin Rouge. And Baz Luhrmann, speaking in you know the late '90s, said this was like the first the first rave, the first rave. That's what the Moulin Rouge was. Um, I don't know if raves are still a thing, but it's this wild party and so when i think about the composition choices at this sequence of the film what do they make me think about they make me think about going to a wild party they make me feel like i'm in one the way that the camera is moving the really fast cuts the sense of sometimes not being quite sure what i'm watching the confusion the madness of like there's skirts being thrown up in the air and there's hats being tossed around and sometimes there's old men with top hats leering at me and then i turn to the other side and there's one of the diamond dogs and over here there's all this chaos going on on with the duke and toulouse lautrec spilling something on him and confusion over who's waving a hanky at who it's like being in a dance club being, it's like being at a rave. It's like being at a big party. It's like being down in the front in the mosh pit at a really crazy concert. And how do you make an audience feel that when they're just sitting in a dark theater or sitting at home? Well, you do it through all sorts of compositional decisions, right? That are clarified to some degree by some of the design decisions that are made for mise-en-scene. Everything that's within the frame. So we are invited to the Moulin Rouge for this incredible experience. And I think that whatever this film doesn't do, um, it strikes the right notes for making modern audiences feel what it would be like to have been at the Moulin Rouge, to have been on the dance floor, to have experienced all of this and take us along for a journey where along with Christian and Satine we fall in love too next week we're going to be taking a look at a different journey we're going to go on a very very different journey no no well there's a dance at the beginning but it's it's not a it's not a party we are well it is a party it's a it's a party of adventurers um on a quest thing uh as we take a look at uh Peter Jackson's Fellowship of the Ring and we're going to be talking about cinematography, one of the things that that movie won an Academy Award for. So until next time, thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you soon. Take care.